Greetings friends. Welcome to Sovereign Grace Doctrine. We thank you for taking time out of your busy day to watch our videos. And if you've never listened to us before, we pray that you'll give us a chance to set the Word of God before you, that we might bring glory and honor unto the Lord. We believe in using the King James Bible. It is the Word of God unto us. It is Scripture. And the Bible says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. We believe the Word of God. It is the final authority in all matters of faith and practice to us that are believers. We, in this series of videos, we are studying through the book of 1 Corinthians. We are in chapter 9, and uh, we'll pick up again here and uh, read from verse 9 down here a ways. He says here again, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it all together for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt. This is written that he that ploweth should plow in hope. And he that thrasheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power. But suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do ye not know what they which... Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which wait on the altar are partakers with the altar. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glory void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. As Paul continues, as we see here, to set these things before us, and as he set them before the church at Corinth in these letters, it is for our edification that we might be strengthened in our faith that we might know how we ought to serve God and how together in the churches of the Lord, how that together we ought to live for God, how that we ought to support the work of the ministry, and this here in particular as he sets it before us, that we might understand that our pastors, which we have through the days of our life, they're there to minister unto us of spiritual things, and how that the church has a responsibility, my friends, to provide for the work of the ministry, to provide for the pastors, to take care of them, to see that their needs are met, and that those funds that come in, the tithes and offerings that come into the church are for that purpose. And it's to the shame of the people that, of the past and of today even that may have this opinion that they should not, that the, there have been those that just didn't feel it was their responsibility. They didn't feel it was their responsibility to provide for the man of God. And that is to their shame. For it is our responsibility as a church to provide for our pastor and see that his needs are met. Even if he does not ask it of us, it's our responsibility. Now as he spoke thereof, as we were in verse 13 last time, speaking about how that the, those that ministered in the temple, those holy things therein, how that they lived of the things of the temple, and those that were, uh, as he spoke of the altar, how those who were the altar were, were partakers with the altar, and that their system which existed in Old Testament times, and even up to that time of Christ, and uh, the priesthood there, and how the other tribes were, pro were to provide for them, we have that same responsibility. But we have, even today, a greater responsibility because of the gospels going forth to this world. 
It is the power of God unto salvation, and we should not hinder it. We should do all we can to promote it, to help our pastor, to help him be able to focus on the ministry of the Word of God and to us and spiritual things, and that we also can help, and we should help, other churches as we can, other works as we can, mission works wherever we can, as God lays them upon our heart. For he says now in verse 14, Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Even as those that ministered in the temple and that priesthood of the Levites and how uh, it was, it was uh, ordained in those days of God and the responsibility of the tribes to provide for them, to give an inheritance unto them, to give food unto them, to give the, you know, that, and that food that came unto the temple. It was there for the priesthood. And that brethren today, it is responsibility as us as believers to support our local churches. And by supporting our local churches, we support our pastor. And by supporting our local churches, we support the work of the gospel. Wherever too we send aid to help the work of the gospel to the mission fields in our country, in our regions of our own areas where we live, and to the regions beyond, even to all the world, wherever we can help and do support the gospel, that's a part of it. That that which we provide, that which has God has blessed us as the members of a church, as he blesses the families of the church, and as they find that they're able to, even at times, to go above and beyond what God would require of us. And that basic thing, yes, that tenth, that tenth, it is a, it's a pattern, it's an example set unto us that even from the days of old, that a tenth God said. God said, well, God, to start with, God said, it's all mine. And I'm giving unto you these things that you might be able to live and might be able to fare and to do fair and to do good in your days. But that tenth, a tenth of that which I've given unto you, you to give back, to give unto the temple. And we still have this same principle before us, that we ought to, the very minimum, we ought to give a tenth unto the house of God. We ought to give a tenth of everything that comes unto us. they will give it unto the Lord. And beyond that, we even ought to give offerings, as God lays it upon our hearts and makes us able. And as we see a need arise, whether it be just a basic need that our pastor, we find he would have in his ministry, in his life, as, he's, as he ministers unto us, as the local church where he pastors, but beyond that, even as he goes forth and he's seeking to reach out to those in the community, even as we all should, striving to be a witness to those in the community wherein we live, that he's striving to do that and his needs, being able to, having the need to be able to go around, uh, the the need of transportation, the need of the fuel to do so, uh, the need of the food that's needed for him and his family and all the daily and basic needs, these responsibilities fall to the church. And beyond that, even as we think of the mission fields, those missionaries out there in no one church alone could necessarily support a mission work out there. Many churches working together to support each of those works and provide the needs of the missionaries that are in the fields. Certainly the church that, is sent, that sends out that missionary heads up the work. They have responsibility to oversee it, oversee the man of God in that mission field, and to make it known that this brother here, where we be at, that he has a need. And certainly that man would send out a report, and that, that church it is what we call a mother church. It's watching over that work, that they too would echo the need and say, yes, we are doing what we can. But that need does exist, and we support this work. And all these things, we all work together for the gospel and to support the men of God who preach the gospel in our lives and our communities and around the world as God makes us able, that the work of the gospel be not hindered, that the work of the gospel can continue to go unto the world, even as God said it's to go unto the world. Christ said to preach the gospel unto all the world. Now, my friends, we have seen a great change in the ability of the preaching of the gospel in our days of our life. When I was young, you could, on Sunday morning, you could turn on a radio or turn on a television, 
and you could hear preachers in your community and in your country perhaps, at least here in the United States, maybe some other countries do not have this blessing, but I do believe that there's radio for most parts of the world where you could hear over the radio. But it's been localized. It can only go so far. Only in that local community or in our own country could we see here in our country. Maybe occasionally something from abroad. But God is foretold of an increase of knowledge and things changing. And the blessing of the internet. And this medium which we now use to send out the Word of God to all you out there all around the world, many of you here in the United States that have seen this video, people in Australia, people in Europe, all around the world this goes forth. Oh, how things have changed. How the work of the Gospel is changing and making it able that all the churches of the Lord can send out the message of the gospel to the whole world now through this medium of the internet, through YouTube especially, through other sources, many use Facebook and perhaps some of these others. But yet we do know this, we see resistance. We see great resistance from Facebook and those that control it. They resist the gospel, they re resist the ministry of the gospel. YouTube in certain ways resists the ministry of the gospel, and so I'm sure that the others do too. But God has still opened this door. He's made this way, and I know that there are those that have looked down on television. They've looked there are those that look down on the internet, look down on this. But I say, oh well, I don't have anything to do with that. But brethren, do we not understand and know that these things had to come to pass to fulfill the word of God? How is it that we think? How do we really think? You, know, you have to wonder back in the days of old before all this uh, here in the last couple of centuries came into existence, back in the dark ages, back when we didn't, they didn't have modern electricity and running water, none of this here uh, magical, fantastic thing of a video image coming into your house existed. Even a voice out of a box at radio before it even existed. How did they think that the world would see two witnesses over there in the Holy Land, who had done great things. How did they think the world would see those two witnesses laying dead in the streets, and that the whole world would celebrate to know they were dead? They now can. Through the marvel of this internet, this age in which we live, this age of communication, this age of knowledge that is increasing abundantly, my friends, you used to have to go to institutions of learning. There would be the books, the libraries, and the colleges and universities. You would have to go there to learn of things and read of them. Think about our ability now to, to search the internet for anything you want to know. And yes, there's a lot of falseness out there, a lot of lies, a lot of deception about things. You have to kind of, you have to know who you're listening to and who, where you're going to. But this work of the gospel, how that God has opened up the door of this internet, and how we have the ability now to go forth into the world. And there are, there are many out here that are asking you to support them and give them money. I, I don't need a dime from you, my friends. I don't need a dime. God provides for me and my family. The local church that we're members of helps provide for us. And the work of the ministry which we do there and elsewhere helps provide for us over this here medium, over this here internet. We don't need a dime from anyone that would watch these videos. But yet we see many out there. Uh, which is, they, they, are, they want people to fund them. They want people to support them, to support their work. Now, there's a lot of works out there I couldn't support because they don't preach the Word of God. They don't believe the Word of God. They want to argue against the Word of God. They work against the Gospel. But in and through the local visible church is the way wherein we should work to support the local work in our areas where we live. But in and through our local church is where we should <coughs> send in our tithes and offerings to reach out to those that we have confidence in that they are called of God to go to the regions where they're at 
that they are preachers of the Word of God and they believe the truth. And if they're not going out there to make a living off of a people that are trusting in them, there have been men like that, went to these uh, third world countries just to get what gain they could from them. And they went, some of them went out there and they, it came to be found out they had multiple wives there. They were, you know, they were taking advantage of the poor, innocent people of those countries that didn't know any better. And to them it was a blessing to give their daughters unto them. Uh, the mindsets of some of these areas are much different than what we have in modern civilizations. But friends, there are those that certainly went forth and they used that power and uh, demanded, they asked of their people where they were at in some of these countries to give unto them all they could, more than what they needed. Some took advantage. Some fell from that position of where God had sent them because sin overpowered their life and they yielded themselves as instruments to unrighteousness and dishonored God. Paul declares unto us in verse 15, he says, But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glory void. Now, there are times when there are those who do give in that money. And they'll give directly to the man of God when they ought to give it in through the church. But I've known them people in churches who come in and they write, to ch they write directly to the pastor a uh, check. Give him a large sum of money directly from them. That they might get a uh, leverage, you might call it, a bargaining chip, even to the point where they could say, hey, or they, they'd even go so far as to, I know one instance where at a church, a well-to-do individual, a man, put a check in the box, and he, he, he made it out to the pastor. He said, pastor, I put that check in the box. You go use it as you want to. Some churches use a plate, they'll pass around a plate, and some churches use what they call an offering box. And it'll maybe be uh, up front by the podium, or maybe back close to the back where people go out, and uh, that, there's nothing wrong with either one of those fashions. But that individual used that as a levering chip, he, or leverage, he was going, or he, he intended to, but God gave that pastor some wisdom, and he asked counsel of some people he trusted. Now, those were my parents back in the day. They still were alive. Now, he asked counsel then, what should I do here? And they told him under no circumstances should he just take that check and put it straight into his account. He said, you put it into the church account, and then it becomes proper, and above board. It's the right thing to do you, since it was in the box. In the plate even. Either way. You put it in the church count and then you use it for the ministry of the Lord. For he did. He tried. He, he thought that pastor took it and put it straight into his account. And then he tried to turn it around. And he was going to say, oh that pastor took that money straight to himself when he ought to put it in the church account. But no. God worked it to where he did not get that leverage over him. Friends, there are those that want to take away the glory of the Lord. They don't want to keep the man of God from glorying. Then he can say, look what God hath done in and through the church and how he's provided for me and how he's blessing this work and helps us to bless others. Paul speaking here as he speaks of himself says, I didn't use this. I didn't seek to get out of those who I ministered to all I could. God provided for Paul. God provides for his ministers. Yes, he does. But this is being given unto us of Paul and yes, of the Lord who inspired the word of God, who gave, he breathed to Paul. He whispered into Paul's mind and heart to write down these things. And to give these examples unto us and we might know how we ought to live and how we ought to deal one with another and how we ought to take care of our pastors. And that yes, there may be pastors at times that are demanding. 
They want this, they want that. And you got to take it with a grain of salt. You got to deal with it gently. And with prayer, my friends, you got to pray that God help the church, God help the pastor to work together for the glory of the Lord. Yes, there are times when the man of God has a sincere need. And there may be those times when it's a want. Something he, he, he'd really rather have a, a brand new vehicle every year. Well, that might be pushing a bit, I'd have to say. That vehicle ought to last more than a year. He might do a lot of running, but if it's well taken care of, uh, I, I have to drive to work every day. And, uh, you know, we're at times we're able to do what needs to be done, times we're not. Sometimes we let things go on a little farther than we should. Don't change the oil, perhaps, as often as you should, but these are all things that you have to take care of what you have and have to be good stewards of what God has given unto you as best you're able. Sometimes finances do hinder you in some of these areas. But as a pastor has needs and the church takes care of him, and yes, if that pastor is demanding, if he seems to be wanting more, then you need to pray for him, pray for the work and the church together working with him and reasoning with the pastor as to what they can and can't do and what they should and shouldn't do. But a God-called man, as we see this example as Paul is unto us, one who did not take advantage of these many churches which he had helped to bring about, that God used him to establish in all the different regions where to he went. Oh, you just think about this here as what we might call him as, a, as one going around traveling like a evangelists have in the past, perhaps still some today, going around, and, oh, love offerings every week flowing in from all the places where they go. And all that money flowing in helped keep them living a life of luxury. Friends, we need to be wise and understand that there are some that take advantage of the gospel. And just because they can preach the gospel don't necessarily mean they need our support. We need to seek wisdom, we need to pray to God, and God giving the pastors of churches wisdom and counsel to guide them who needs the support the most and how much they need. But there are those who want to rob the man of God of the glory that he ought to be able to give unto God for the way that the, the Lord blesses the church and then likewise blesses him. Be weary of those brethren who want to do the end run. They want to not give it straight to the church that it might be a blessing to you, but they want to give it straight to you again. There are those who would want to cause you to have to praise them for their giving unto you directly, rather than you being able to glorify the Lord for the way he blesses the church and blesses all the body, all the members of the church in the ministry of the Lord. It says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me, if I preach not the gospel. As a man of God, I say to you that my financial condition is no excuse as to whether I preach or preach not. I should, <clears throat> as a man of God, I should preach the word of God regardless of my financial standing. Whether I be poor whether I be doing just all right or whether I have an abundance, I ought to preach the gospel, and so should every man of God, so should every pastor, that it's, he should not hinder himself, he should not let his financial condition and his needs hinder his ministry, but he ought to boldly proclaim the word of God, trusting in the Lord, and the Lord is going to help him, and the Lord will use his church where he's at to help him, as he is a faithful steward of those things unto them, and that, uh, that is a basic desire of our hearts as the men of God that woe unto us, my friends. Woe unto us if we preach not the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. And certainly that should be one of the main things that a man of God is focused on. Bearing witness to the God, of the gospel of the community round about him and to all, whosoever he can get to and witness unto them preaching the gospel every time, setting Jesus Christ before the people, and him crucified and lifted up, that they might understand he suffered and died on the cross to save them from their sins, for we are all sinners. 
We are all ungodly sinners, my friends, and Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for sinners, and if you don't understand you're a sinner, how can you then come to God as you should? How can you come unto him in whom you have not heard? How can you come unto him in whom he has not been declared unto you? For it is by the preaching of the word of God that faith cometh. Faith cometh by hearing, and faith cometh by the word of God. Woe is unto us if we preach not the gospel. And my friends, as we preach the gospel, you understand too that those that are babes in Christ first need the milk of the word of God, and they need to be they need to grow up gradually in it. And that we have those that are mature also in our churches who need to meet. And we need to teach, my friends, the all things to the congregation of the Lord, that they might know how they ought to contend for the faith, that the church might be the pillar and the ground of the truth, and that there be strong men and women in our churches that will stand for the truth and witness it to their friends, to their neighbors, to the family, to whoever they can. They'll tell the truth. They'll tell the gospel to the communities wherein they live. And then my friend said, I have nothing to glory of. We have nothing of ourselves to glory. I'm just an old country boy who grew up on a farm who did not have that great of an education, barely got through those 12 grades of education, went on to a little bit of college and and technical training and stuff, and especially the technical training was a help unto us. But brethren, I don't have anything to glory. I am not a great orator. I'm not a great speaker. I'm not uh, one who is fine-tuned in many languages of the world that we might be able to set it before you in more than just this common language, this English that we speak as best we can. So might say, well, at times it don't sound like English. So at times it might not come out as clear and plain as it ought to. But friends, I have nothing to glory in of myself. I have not done great things. But the Lord has. The Lord did a great thing back there many years ago when I was about 10 or so, 10 or 11, I forget exactly now the age. But when God sent unto that lo that their local community, that Baptist church, a man of God to preach unto us in a week of service, to preach there in a week of services, and in that week of services, God used the preaching of that man to bring me to a saving grace of God, to bring me into the saving grace of God, to save me there at that point in time as the Word of God had came forth, as we had heard the Word of God preached from the pastor of the church and pastors of the church, plural, before we don't know, I don't know how many I could say we're under, that we were under there as our parents took us to church. But at the appointed place and time, that one particular individual, where the Word of God came forth again, and it came forth not just in word, but it came forth in power also, my friends, and in the day of salvation, when the gospel go forth, we find that it goes forth, not just in word, but it goes forth in power also to those that are to be saved at that moment and place and time for the glory of God. My friends, there are too many in this world today that want to give the glory to man for him making the choice to come to God as though he can give anything to God. We are saved by the grace of God, not of our works, it's not of ourselves, it's it's of God who willeth and saveth us. And it's of God that we should glory in. Woe unto us. We witness and bear not this gospel. My friends, may God keep you. We're out of time.